Hi, everyone. This is Catherine Spires. You are listening to Smart Mouth. Uh, if you signed up for the newsletter and you are not receiving it, please check your spam inbox. It probably is going there. Uh, but let me know if you can't find it anywhere, please. <laughs> the newsletter can be subscribed to at smartmouth.substack.com in case you aren't already doing so. It is currently free. Uh, if you want to become part of the team making it happen, please do visit patreon.com slash smartmouthpodcast. Now let's begin the show. Courtney Nichols is the founder and owner of Disco Dining Club. Thank you so much for joining us on this rainy Sunday. Of course. Thank you. So Disco Dining Club, I feel like the name, you get a lot from the name. You kind of have a sense of what it is, but let's have you lay it out more. Disco Dining Club is a theatrical and thematic food and drink experience that roams around Los Angeles. Each time it's a new theme, new chef, new mixologist, new costume designers, new actors, new set designers, all to bring together this very cohesive, colorful narrative surrounding food. Wow. So is it different every time? Like sometimes could there be like a bunch of like visual artist people and the next time you happen to curate like, like a bunch of music people or something like that? Precisely. The programming is reflected through the narrative and theme of the event. So for instance, we have an upcoming event that's all based on the myth of Medusa and we'll have multiple dance troops there as well as snake charmers. So it's very narrative. Wait, fueled. with actual snakes? With actual snakes. See, <laughs> I, this is one of those you had me in the first half things. So I was like, ooh, because Gorgons are like one of, there's only like three things in my life that I've been like, I could get a tattoo of that. And Gorgons is one of them. Oh, incredible. Which Medusa was a Gorgon. But then you said actual snakes and I was like, nope. Uh, I've learned a lot about the show business of snakes really? through this process because uh, to be a snake that could be uh, in a more performative aspect, yeah. it has to be non-venomous, of course. That makes so much sense. Uh, which <laughs> seems obvious, but I didn't think of because I think all of us just presume that every snake is venomous and will kill us. Uh, uh, also, they prefer snakes that have a little bit more character to them. So I've actually been looking at photos of snakes that will smile to the camera. Oh, my gosh. I've learned a lot. Is that something like that that particular snake just has a face shape that looks like smiling? It must be, because I doubt that they necessarily have the reflex to smile yeah, or the or emotions. Like how to train a snake. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I haven't gone that far. Maybe I'll, by next week, maybe I'll know how to train a snake. See, it's, I know it's stupid, but that's why I think that my fear of snakes might straight up be a phobia. Mm. I'm terrified of them. I, I've noticed that they either people have no feeling towards them or don't get them yeah. near them within a mile of them. So <laughs> it must, it leans towards phobia. Um, my little cousin had her seventh birthday party this summer and they had one of those reptile guys come. Right. And I, like any, lizards, fine. <laughs> Anytime they brought out a snake, I was like halfway down the block. <laughs> I could not deal with it. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you must plan these events there every month you said more or less and but you must have them planned out way way in advance especially because menus are on the table <laughs> precisely and because there's such a level of immersion that goes into each event that it takes uh, multiple months to not only conceive of but also fabricate a lot of our props or our tablescapes that being said i've done events in three weeks because it happened to be the a venue fell in my lap and I had okay. to realize a theme very quickly or it's a private client where I have to work within a very short time frame. But I prefer the more luxurious multiple months lead up so I can really flesh out these concepts. Yes. And speaking of luxury, all of your food ideas were oysters, caviar, and then like silly luxury, like what we are going to talk about today, which is maraschino cherries. Uh, highbrow, lowbrow. <laughs> yes. All about that. That is the entire ethos, not only of Disco Dine Club, but also of myself. Okay. Uh, I love dabbling between the two worlds. It's the most fun. It is. Balance. Yeah. Gotta have balance. <laughs> exactly. It's that, like when you think about it, it's actually very zen. It is. It, re it really is. <laughs> it's my form of meditation. There we go. <laughs> um, I embarrassed myself uh, researching maraschino cherries because I've always called them that. And then reading it, I realized, oh, it's maraschino, really. In really? Italian. Yeah, the SCH. And That's for funny. me to not have realized that because I'm one of those boring people who always corrects um, other people when they say bruschetta. 
It's bruschetta. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Me too, actually. That's funny that I would never think about the pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. I I think it might be because we don't. Um, I took Italian, but we're not really talking about maraschino cherries a lot. Um, you know. You're right. It's not in the common <laughs> vernacular. <Right. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so there is a, a chemist actually who writes about or yeah, she wrote a book called Fix the Pumps, which is about the history of soda fountains. So she kind of does what I do, but from a science background where she's like, look at this fun thing. This is how it came to be. And she calls what we consider maraschino cherries now a real cherry with the cherry flavor removed. Oh, because they go through so much processing. Maraschino cherries are indeed real cherries. That have been processed to heck. I recall that, I don't know if it's myth or not, that if you eat an entire jar of maraschino cherries, (laughs) that it's poisonous. Well, the thing is, is that, um, you know, before the FDA and the USDA got involved in what we ate, they could just do anything to any food. And so brining, sometimes on a commercial level, um, could have really dangerous things in it. There's a common myth, indeed, that there that it's brined in formaldehyde, right? Which it's not anymore. Okay, good to know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good to know. <laughs> and it probably never was. I read something about that that um, there could be elements in the pesticides where the actual cherries are grown that has formaldehyde in them because non-organic pesticides can have formaldehyde in them. So they're probably just as poisonous for you as any other produce. Wow, because I always thought, or maybe romanticize, if I was to take myself out, it would be with a <laughs> jar of maraschino cherries. I love that. <laughs> that is fun. I've never heard any like such a whimsical suicide plan. It's very fun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so what's funny though about how fake they are is that it comes from this very old. No one knows exactly how old um, recipe slash. I would say entire lifestyle from the coast of Croatia, where they grow marasca cherries. And they've been turning them into liqueur for a very long time. Mm. This is sort of the origins of it. Okay. And we kind of got to go back and forth a little bit because I'm assuming, you know, I, funnily enough, I have a jar of maraschino cherries in my fridge right now. Oh, it's like Safeway brand. Yeah. Bright, bright red. <laughs> <laughs> but you're familiar with Luxardo cherries, of course, right? Yes. Now, these are the fancy jarred cherries. Oh, I didn't realize the uh, the hierarchy of cherries. Okay, they're I'm definitely learning a lot is. tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there really is. Um, I gosh, I'm like getting ahead of myself. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm just gonna say this part now. Okay. Did you know that there are like maraschino cherries in all colors? It's just the red ones sell the best. <gasps> yeah. So looking around, I saw <sighs> green ones. Oh my god. Okay. Green. I was like, this is vaguely familiar to me. I feel like maybe I've seen green ones, maybe fruitcake. That's exactly because it does have that candied fruit yeah. vibrancy, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But then there's blue ones. Oh, weird. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that too much? Yeah. I even tweeted about it. I was so upset. <laughs> <laughs> Don't care for that. <laughs> um, but OK, going way, way back. Maraschino liqueur, because it originally this thing that we call maraschino was a liqueur, an herbal liqueur um, made in a town um, now called Zadar, which is in what is now Croatia. But I've been there. Have you really? That's even more bizarre. And I had no idea. I did drink an excessive amount of digestifs and liqueurs while I was there, but I had no idea the origin story. Interesting. I love Croatia. I've always had this... Uh, obsession with it really yeah the lifestyle is great it's perfect food also because you're taking the mediterranean with like a a hint of maybe more eastern european vibes so it's just i love it the music scene there is why i go oh really to to a festival a couple years ago oh yeah but how funny maybe to see it was just it was in my pores already i had no idea it was meant to be it was meant to be absolutely yeah um so that's that's where it came from at the time uh where that part of Croatia was kind of Italy. You know, the concept of Italy is very new. They started it, making it more, but then after World War II, they, um, it's a long story, they basically got bombed out. They took the Marasca cherries trees with them. And that's why now all of these like maraschino brands, specifically Luxardo, are Italian. They're mostly grown in Italy now. Okay. The fancy ones. Yeah. 
<laughs> I can't stop thinking about blue cherries. It, yeah, it sticks with you. It's uh, it, it makes sense, though, logically, that as a consumer, you would want the color that matches the fruit. Because right. Because cherries are associated with red or pink. But uh, still, they're not... You're not taking them from a fresh shelf. You're taking them from a jar. So why wouldn't the more insane colors work? Isn't there like a term for that or something? When we see, when we're used to seeing something and then it's presented to us differently, our like human Ooh. reaction is to go, ew. I think it's because like in right. nature, if a fruit is the wrong color, you're like, well, that's probably gone bad and is going to poison me. Completely. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, I guess it would be like uh, if you think you're eating vanilla and it actually is chocolate when it comes to ice cream. It's really just distorts your sense of reality, yeah. I would imagine. Kind of like how people don't think about the fact that red velvet cake is just chocolate cake. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, it's the wrong it, color. It, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's I, I don't want to call it a scam, but it seems like a scam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the cherries were brined in salt water and then preserve, preserved in this liqueur, this maraschino liqueur, um, which is basically just like the entire cherry smashed up. Like they throw some leaves in there. They throw the pits in there. It was clearly like a, well, what are we going to do with these cherries? Because cherries um, go bad pretty quickly right. off the tree, too. And they have a very short season anywhere in the world that they're grown. Uh, grown. So, it you know, they've got like Kirschwasser in right. German. You know, this like the the smashing up of the cherries and turning them into booze. Not unusual the world over. So the making of the liqueur, um, you know, cherries are sour. Mm. You know how like the ones that grow on the West Coast and we eat them ostensibly off the tree. They're really sweet. Right. But the kinds that are grown in like the upper Midwest um, are sour. They're very sour. Right. Like pie cherries. Oh, right. Yeah. They're of course. Wow. Cherries are diverse. They really are. <laughs> they really, really are. So they add a bunch of sugar to these marasca cherries, um, which I think is probably where the idea that like, ooh, how sweet can we get this? Mm. Like probably came from. And then traditionally, they also added a lot of uh, flowers to it. Um, the almond flavor. Do you get an almond flavor from maraschino cherries when you eat them? That's a fascinating question. Uh, I suppose I've had a garnish of that cherry more often than not in a whiskey almond mix. So I guess there's maybe a reference point for me when it comes to that flavor combo. But I don't, is that are they soaked in that? Or so steep? originally the almondy flavor right. came just from the cherry pits. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. they're just similar, right? Because they are relatives actually so they've got a similar flavor oh. but now that almond flavor is added in to most commercial maraschino cherries i honestly cannot wait to eat a cherry now <laughs> I, I wait to dissect a maraschino cherry beyond belief <laughs> i know seriously and also do you know the flavor profile of dr pepper i feel like i once learned this and it shook me it's what? cherry almond Oh, right. That's so yeah. weird. That's yeah. so weird. <laughs> With like a bunch of other botanicals as well, but those are the main two. And it's funny to me because I feel like Dr. Pepper is a digestif. I like completely... all the ingredients make it such, but also a shit ton of sugar and carbonation. Of course. <laughs> that, but it's funny. Growing up, the type of person that preferred Dr. Pepper, I always again romanticized i was like that is like that's an advanced flavor palette right there that is so funny <laughs> i love that i've circled back now i like it as an adult but as a kid it was something i aspired to like it's pretty spicy as it is you know as far as sodas can be spicy 100 percent. it totally is the most spicy so that yeah gosh you romanticize that too you get really excited about this I kind of get stuff really excited. <laughs> <laughs> Tis the season also, you know, we're going into Valentine's Day weekend and I'm about to produce a dinner that's like highly erotic. So I just I'm in that frame. What that does that frame. mean? Uh, this one, we're really we're leaning into the more provocative nature of my feast. There's always a sensibility at the dinner table that's a little bit, I would say, perverse, uh, mostly comes through through people's costuming. Uh, and the sort of energy that they embrace when they walk into a disco dying club. But this one, also the programming is highly sexual. We're having a dark corner with a dominatrix. We have actual uh, dancers are called Jolene and they're a trans inclusive group of professional dancers that perform like cheetahs or jumbos or they roam around and they're actually doing performances during the dinner itself. That's on so, a pole. so for everyone not in LA, cheetahs and jumbos are two of our premier strip clubs. Indeed. Bikini <laughs> bar, though. Well, does Cheetah allow boobs? I don't know. But 
I Jumbo think, sets it elaborate. Right. I know. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I, everyone thinks that LA is so wacky, but everybody, here's the rules in the city of LA. If you have alcohol, you cannot have bare boobies. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So like Seventh Veil, which I believe has no alcohol, it's, it is full frontal nudity. Yes. It's yeah. one or the other in LA. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we are the most boring people. Yeah, I know. I know. It's puritanical. <laughs> so puritanical. <laughs> Have you ever had to kick anyone out of one of your dinners? Have people gotten a little too too caught up? Uh, we've had a couple moments. Uh, you know, knock on all the wood, it hasn't been rampant. But year one, there was a... Uh, God, I hope they're... Uh, let's see what they think of this when I say it aloud. Uh, <laughs> it w- there was a literal cat fight. And what was so kind of hilarious about this cat fight is that the women who had it or were in it were dressed in cliche disco polyester wear and fake afros. And that is never really the aesthetic nor the garb that typically our clientele wears. Uh, but when they walked in the door, I'm like, oh, well, they really took the theme literally. Uh, and then they got in a cat fight and then they escorted themselves out and everybody thought it was a performance. That <laughs> is amazing. It was because I, I was you know, stressed out. I was like one giant high watching it happen. And then to watch them take themselves and leave and then everybody be like, that was such a great immersive moment. <laughs> it's like they, I love they it. thank the disco gods. Yeah. yeah. So did they come together? They did. And they they left and then they left together that it was, it was i would have thought quite the it moment. was uh, part of it too it, totally especially since they were wearing these cliche costumey bell bottoms and giant gold chains and were you a little bit like like i know you just said you were a giant hive but you were a little bit like this is cool though <laughs> there was a moment there was because if there was going to be a fight that went down i'm glad there was a group of seemingly jovial women uh <laughs> You know, who I knew were all friends. It wasn't strangers fighting. So there was something sort of, you know, deeply hilarious oh, about no. it. Oh, no. Year one, though. We're at year five now. So we've we've uh, we've matured a bit. <laughs> Everyone's matured. Everyone's matured. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I was also, I should note, I, at the time I was experimenting with late dinners. Mm-hmm. So that dinner, I believe, didn't get served until about 10 p.m., 11 p.m., uh, which is admittedly sort of rough in the LA climate. Um, were they just hangry? They were hangry, I think. <laughs> they were they were totally hangry. <laughs> you are so right that that's too late for Angelinos again going back to the theme of like how what boring puritans we are. We are an early to bed early to rise city. 100%. I especially god forbid you work at a company that also has East Coast employees, then you have to be up at the crack of dawn to make sure you're on the right time schedule. So I think that just lends itself to this early evening You're probably atmosphere. right. Any company I've worked on worked at where there's an East Coast element, we kowtow to their needs. Yeah, 100%. Completely. 100%. We still think we're like the younger brother Americans. I'm so accurate. <laughs> And so now I should know because I do have a stronghold within the warehouse community. The warehouse scene here in LA is amazing, but now, that has nothing to do with warehouse. food. <laughs> like a warehouse party, like <laughs> electronic it. music. Yeah. I definitely was like dudes driving tractors around. <laughs> <laughs> that too. I'm sure that definitely has a late night vibe. <laughs> Yes, I have heard that um, someone told me that right now LA's warehouse parties rival Berlin's. Mm. There's a lot of transplants also. So, uh, you know, when the, I would say the warehouse scene was foaming at the mouth a few years ago, um, or like five, six years ago, it's a lot of overseas DJs were stopping over in LA for the first time. So you were sort of organically creating that culture of rambunctiousness uh, that mimics Berlin or Paris or, you know, even Mexico City, for instance. Uh, and now it's just become sort of this go-to location for these DJs to stop over because they know that the dance floor is always crowded. It's always vibrant. And then maybe it is because it's a necessity because things close early here. You know, it's not a choice to go to a warehouse party. It's like an <laughs> obligation. Yes. <laughs> the night elves have nothing else to nothing do. Nothing else. <laughs> Like a night hike? No. No. <laughs> no. That's not an overlapping crowd. Yeah, it's exactly not at all. 
<laughs> That's so funny because I had no idea any of this was going on. It's it's a really it's intense. Uh, you know, I was very much in it for a while, which means that you're going to sometimes three warehouse parties a weekend. Oof. And that's really the origin story of Disco Dying Club was because I wanted to combine that liveliness of the dance floor with the sort of rambunctious sloppiness of a really extraordinary feast. Okay. Uh, so a lot in my first year, a lot of the events took place in a warehouse spot. It was a little bit more all night, um, a little bit 50-50 between dance and food. And then it, over the past few years, it's become a little bit more food focused. I see. That like fits in with the general zeitgeist of Los Angeles too. Precisely. Very food focused city. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's been a very organic, genuine trajectory, but it, that's... My personal story started uh -huh. in a warehouse. <laughs> what are the cool drugs right now? That's a very, uh, well, I, you know, funny side note, and maybe this is not drug related at all, but I, there is definitely a trend towards sobriety when it comes to no alcohol. Oh. Um, I've noticed that is over the past few years and uh, it's sort of come to the forefront recently. New York specifically has a bar now that has, it's the bar vibe, but there's no alcohol served. It's all non-alcoholic drinks like Ken or Seed Lip um, or just like really, really good mocktails. And I see that sort of translating to LA in a way that people are just not drinking as much. God knows what they're doing in the restroom, <laughs> but they're not drinking as much. <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting. Uh, okay, this is, you know, not uh, across the board, but I've just noticed it as a recent trend. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, you would notice what people are not doing also. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's a fun little fact. <laughs> yes. I <had> no idea. <laughs> okay, so Luxardo, we're kind of focusing on them just because they're like a name, a known quantity at this point. Um, I think most people even who are not heavy drinkers, Matilda is in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh, adorable. Okay, we're done podcasting. It's just the Matilda yeah, exactly. hour now. Bye. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me see. Where were we? Um, okay, Luxardo was, the company was founded in present-day Croatia in 1821. But then um, during World War II, that town just got bombed to smithereens the town that they were in so that's why they moved to italy just because of world war ii wow okay yeah they moved there right after um the war they had been an italian family originally they were starting to make their own maraschino liqueur the still a uh, um, secret recipe mm. but the only thing they have said is that they do not put in any flowers Oh, interesting. All the other ones have flowers. They said no to flowers. Oh. And even though we're talking about the liqueur, their cherries, the actual fruit, will be will have the same flavor profile. They invented or started doing just the cherries um, or added the cherries to their lineup, I should say, in 1905. By 1906 in the New York Times, they were talking ab about cherries in cocktails and... Let's see. The New York Times said that the cherry, the cherry in the seductive beverage is commonly looked upon as an added temptation for the one who imbibes. Um, and specifically that for women, it's probably the prime reason for drinking alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Kind of love that quote. I mean, it's absurd, <laughs> but I love it. Yes. <laughs> so absurd. It's always had this idea that it was... Um, Mostly appreciated by ladies, mm. which is something we do in America, probably other Western countries. Sweet is feminine. Yes. Funny side note. Yeah. I, uh, my brother lives in Daytona Beach, Florida, and he recently, or actually it was a couple of years ago, he sent me uh, uh, pouches, like Capri Sun pouches of wine, and they were very sweet. They were key lime flavored wine. Oof, and and the tagline was, <laughs> finally, wine that tastes good. Wow. Wow. What a bold tagline. I know. I know. <laughs> That's, I love that though. I wonder if it worked. Cause I do think, you know, you see something written down as if it's fact and you believe it. Precisely. But I definitely <laughs> know that their client or their target market was definitely more housewives. I, yeah. Florida housewives. Yeah. <laughs> That's gotta be. Oh, so insulting. I know. Oh my Deep goodness. Yeah. That is so funny. Yeah. And I love key lime pie. Me too. Out yeah, of they destroy wine and key lime pie right. in one foul swoop. That's that's impressive in its own way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness. So 
Um, people were getting into cherries in their drinks. And, you know, it is like a part of the a lot of old cocktails, your old fashions, your Manhattans, that sort of thing. That's totally. in both of those, isn't it? Or am I making that up? Um, it's at least in old fashions. Definitely. In uh, Manhattan, yes. Of yes. course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Whew, yes. Good. <laughs> Sometimes I say things and then I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my life. <laughs> So they got so popular that the Luxardos actually built another distillery. But then during World War II, not only, I mean, obviously, like imports were down, obviously. But um, the this is where real cherries, European tradition cherries, I shouldn't say real, because as I said at the top of this very episode, right. even the ones with the bright one run, red ones are real as well right but this is where they started to diverge okay basically and it's sort of where these um let's say uh more mature italian maraschino cherries dropped market share almost completely okay it was fully into the red stuff which makes sense when you know about uh, mid-century americana the more processed the better right the bright more brightly colored the better yes betty crocker um came up with maraschino cherry cake in 1947 that called for 18 maraschino cherries Oh, I feel like I've seen a graphic of this. Because also pineapple upside down cake very yes. famously needs the maraschino cherry. It sure yes. does. Yeah. Yeah. Which, that's why Which I have my jar of it. absolute favorite cake, I think. It's a good it's one. It's amazing. Do you make it? I do. Okay. I mean, but make meaning I don't really make the batter. Like it's it's <laughs> store I mean I make the cake. But not all the separate pieces. Fair. <laughs> Box mix is great. It really is. It's, you know, I, 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 I. <laughs> one day I'll learn how to bake. Maybe. <laughs> I will say because I started making um, a pineapple upside down cake this winter and uh, it's very easy. As I would love to have your recipe if possible. Yeah, it's okay. actually the Neelys. Um, they're divorced now, but as a couple, they were Food Network celebrities. Oh, right. For a right. While. Yeah, of course. And it's N-E-A-L-Y. So the Neelys pineapple upside down corn grit cake. <gasps> oh, shit. It's really good. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm addition- also a sucker for corn. So. Yes. Okay. It's oh. you'll love it. Okay. It's very good and very easy to make. Um, and I don't think you actually the cherries don't add anything, but they make it look cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a garnish. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> so there's this book that I became familiar with um, in researching this episode. I know Matilda is all I, in I your did business. The best. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Charles H. Baker wrote The Gentleman's Companion, and it's sort of, I actually just got it, and Mm. it's there on the um, table. It is a collection of drink recipes slash memoir slash travel book, and I don't know. I haven't been able to look into it enough yet. I don't know if it is meant to be tongue-in-cheek or if the author of this book wanted to believe that he had all the adventures outlined oh, interesting. in said book because can i read you the name of one of the drinks oh, in it? please the aster hotel special from shanghai during a trip around the world in the year 1926 and on the occasion of our becoming marooned in that city with our own ship and personal belongings gone on to hong kong and with a delightful young maiden by whom we were later rejected in marriage and who later distinguished herself by espousing a very nice gentleman whose main claim to fame is that he was once kidnapped by carpus prior to the latter's entering his suite in alcatraz that's the name of a drink. This is, this is like the Wes Anderson of <laughs> recipe books. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I feel like it's meant to be tongue in cheek. It has to be. I would hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes. I also, from this book, learned about a whole genre of drinks called Pousse Café or Café. Yeah. Pousse Café, which is basically just layered drinks. Mm. So the maraschino liqueur is always in it because it's bright red. Oh. And you do it by um, stacking them in order of their like viscosity. So they have more wow. viscous drinks at the bottom and it gets lighter. Yes. That's incredible. Yes. The the simplest one is grenadine maraschino and creme yvette. I'm but- surprised that hasn't made its way into the popular zeitgeist as of late. I feel like there's such a return to the sort of quintessential ancient cocktails. That should make a comeback. I absolutely agree with you. I do think that, um, so this is something that I've thought about tiki bars. Mm. I think tiki bars are necessarily very small because a very big one opened recently, a few years ago in LA. And that's when I first realized, oh, tiki drinks are way too complicated to make for a crowd. Mm. 
Right. So that's why tiki bars, I think, traditionally are so small because each drink takes like seven minutes to make. Oh, that makes so much sense. And we're like beachside where if it does take a little bit longer, you don't care your beach right. side. Exactly. You know, you're not, it's not that grind like you're in a dive bar and you need to get a shot of whiskey really quick. <laughs> yeah. You're totally right. Yeah. Right. So that might be part of the reason. I mean, somebody should open, someone very well funded should open a very small Pus Cafe bar where the simplest drink has three layers to uh, it. It's an in- oh, okay. Okay. There, um, we could do this together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It would be great. Okay. I'd be so done, excited. Done, 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 done. <laughs> I have no funding, yeah. but I'd be so yeah. enthusiastic. <laughs> That's the first step one. And yeah. then we get the funding. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Sheer charm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this book also has a collection of cocktails called The Angels. This is also a very horny book. It probably goes I know, without I mean, saying. It's called the exotic drinking book, so yeah. you would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So. so basically, um, he the angel number one um, is called Angel's Tit. That's the original, and you can add like the Angel's Two, whatever is other. But the Angel's Tit is maraschino liqueur topped with with cre- whipped cream, and then one maraschino cherry on top. Oh, oh. I do love it. I love it. I want to hate it, but I love it. Yeah, I know. It's like there's something just so kitsch, of course, and so whimsical and playful. It's it's like the Madonna Inn incarnate. When that's it exactly what it is. Yeah. That. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You should do a classic cocktail event there. The that colors of the it. cocktails and the surroundings would match. That would be so ideal. Now, how do we get Maraschino cherries to sponsor? Well, that's the question luxardo sponsored event but would it be luxardo because is luxardo because oh, right. you know that luxardo is more of that like deeper purple you're color. right no it would have to be it gotta be one of the tacky yeah ones. it has to be tacky so yeah he's got all these different angels and of course the unifying theme is that they all have a maraschino cherry popped on top so <laughs> so cool he also um i noticed he got super horned up every time he talked about this liqueur called damiana Mm. which I was not familiar with, but I looked up the bottle and it is in the shape of a woman's torso. You can see it here. It's very round. You can see that it has breasts. And it's yellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The liqueur is yellow. Yeah. And it's just like, you definitely get the sense that this guy was fondling the bottle. Oh, every time. A little nipple twister. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He was into that sort of thing. He totally was. (laughs) (laughs) It's so, when you read sex stuff from different eras that you have no familiarity with, you're like, is this fun or am I scared? Someone please tell me. It's such a fine line. It's (laughs) such a fine line. Yep. It really is. (laughs) Um, So in America, the definition of maraschino cherries legally kept changing. And it basically has to do with um, how terrified we are of additives, how patriotic we're being. And when I say patriotic, I mean more like uh, nationalist, jingoist, mm. that sort of thing. So part of the famous Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, um, there's a maraschino cherry section. And that is where it says that it must be bottled to count as a maraschino cherry. It must be bottled in the maraschino liqueur, liquor. Oh, okay. That's what it says. And it says it cannot be bottled in a compound of benzalahide, oil of almonds, and glucose. Oh, wow. Okay. And you hear the alahide and you think mm. form, form, of course, yeah. now I can't even say it, <laughs> formaldehyde. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so you get where like this idea that it's poison comes from. And so this is when... Um, in 1906, everyone was freaking out about everything becoming um, pure. So they said, put it in the liquor that it's meant to come in. Don't add poisons to it. So that's Magical. where we, the first time the government started talking about yeah. it, that's what they said about it. Okay. Um, and then there's this whole thing where we talked about how the idea was that women liked the cherries. Right. Um, but also men who like tits like it too. So <laughs> see, it's for, for everyone. Yeah. For everyone. <laughs> <laughs> literally <laughs> um so during uh leading up to prohibition and during the temperance era um the the women usually women leading it really were in support of soda fountains being built everywhere oh okay because it was like well we're not just gonna get rid of a vice that's not how humans work we've got to replace it right so the idea of sugar being a replacement for alcohol was a big part of sort of like the um the pragmatic side of the temperance movement 
to like oh, get everyone out of the taverns and into the soda fountains and sugar them up. Right. And they won't know the difference. And they I won't guess. because we, uh, as most people know, when you take a break from alcohol, you end up craving sugar more. Right. You know, I, all of a sudden I, I like take a three week break from alcohol and I'll want more chocolate chip cookies than imaginable. It's like, oh, it's because it's the sugar addiction. Yep. So it makes sense. Logically, totally. it makes sense. Yeah, it completely makes <laughs> sense. So, but, but the problem was, of course, was that um, maraschino cherries legally at the time were in liquor. Oh, oh, of course. Right. So uh, they they were sold at sweet shops at the time and were like a topping in all of like Sundays and whatnot. Yeah. But the temperance women who, you know, big ups to them, they were badass. They were also terrifying mm. like genuinely I'm, terrifying I'm sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so they were like everyone get into the soda fountains but get rid of all those maraschino cherries they're too wow. boozy so another thing that started happening in this era is um tariffs on food so it became wildly expensive to import real maraschino cherries so they started making them in america and in a thing that can kind of happen in america you take some old world product and you're like how can we make it more cheaply right <laughs> and that's where we start getting you know um food coloring in the mm. mix <laughs> um vibrancy oh yeah well we like bright colors we're <laughs> yes. all hummingbirds yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> so originally it had been the marasca cherry and then they tried to find a cherry that grew in america that was a good substitute and they went with the royal Anne. Mm. it's a variety that grows um plentifully in oregon and turns out the state of oregon has a big hand in maraschino cherry history okay never would have guessed it never <laughs> So the tariffs made it more expensive for Italian cherries to be imported, but they were still called maraschino cherries. These American versions at the time had to, 1912-ish, had to be called on the label imitation oh. maraschino cherries. Okay. The, now, this is so, this gets so complicated, at least in my mind, for so that's why I'm like talking slowly about it. So first... Um, they were saying that these ones that were made with imitation products had to be called imitation. And then Prohibition said, if you want to sell your cherries, you can't have alcohol in them. And so this guy at the Oregon Agricultural College, which I believe is Oregon State University now, um, his name was Ernest Wygand. And he was like, okay, how can we recreate this with the Oregon cherries and with no booze? So he created what is essentially the system for making maraschino cherries now, which is a ton of calcium salts. That's oh. what he figured out was the secret for doing it without booze. Wow. Yeah. Also, red dye and almond flavoring. Mm. There we go. Yeah. So there it originally came from the pits, but now we just yeah. add almond flavor to it. Classic American. <laughs> Classic American directory of food. Yes. Take it something really natural is. and make it as. <laughs> immoral and impure as possible that's what we like yes. that's what we like i actually went to muso and frank's last mm. night and i got a shirley temple because i'd been thinking about maraschino cherry i was going to bring up the shirley temple the unsung hero of the non-alcoholic bar menu they're really good they're so good yeah <laughs> and it seems like I, I couldn't tell if i was trying to make an argument for it but i was like no you really if you are paying attention you can really pick up on the almond undertones oh. in it there's and like if you have i bet it tastes different if you have sprite or seven up because those two taste different oh, of course yeah, yeah there's there's elements to it totally <laughs> I'm, t I'm going to consume so many cherries after this it's going to be obscene <laughs> i'll actually test out the myth to see if i could you know yes. OD on maraschino cherries oh my gosh well don't hurt yourself you'll probably just <laughs> get worry. a sugar headache yeah, yeah, first exactly, yeah. <laughs> be really hyped up and probably dye my lips and tongue red mm -hmm. or pink red mm -hmm. pink but you know yeah now, I wonder if anyone's tried to do a Shirley Temple with the Luxardo cherries. With It's a much mm. thicker syrup, and it is a more sophisticated nice. flavor profile. It could be one of those things that tastes like ass because it's actually the fake version tastes better. Totally. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what it'll be. I don't know. <laughs> Who can say? Um, so part of this process also is bleaching. Mm. Um, you got to bleach the cherry first so that the red food coloring actually soaks in. Okay. Also, fruit salad, canned fruit salad, uh, maraschino cherries were a big part. Oh, of yes. This. And then also things like ambrosia salad or is that the same thing with the, the marshmallows and the marshmallow fluff? I actually just had that last weekend in, in Las Vegas at a buffet. It's quite a quite a delicious sugar enhanced 
killer, I would say. Uh, but maraschino cherries were throughout that as well. Yeah. Anytime there's an American food product, the companies will think of a million ways to use it. Completely. It's very 1950s backyard barbecue. Trans- Abs- yeah. Translated into sort of the uh, Edward Scissorhands aesthetic. I, yes, exactly. <laughs> in your mind, was Edward Scissorhands set in the late 80s or in the 1950s? Ooh, I would say probably both, if that's possible. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I asked the question, yeah. I was like, that is, yes, that is yeah. the correct answer. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so now um, that cherries, maraschino cherries, were selling enough, um, it was pitched by their lobbying group in 1939 that now the definition of maraschino cherries without having to put imitation in front of them. The legal definition should be cherries which have been dyed red, impregnated with sugar, and flavored with oil of bitter almonds or a similar flavor. Okay. So they switched it up. They completely reversed it, where now you could only call something a maraschino cherry if it was this fake American style. Wow. Isn't that amazing? What a weird timeline of a cherry. (laughs) I would have never guessed the million years. No, and it there's so, I guess, so many business opportunities because there really is a lobbying group that's about um, glacade fruit. Oh, it's something like called like the um, organization for glacade fruit, which okay. is basically kind of maraschino cherries kind of fall under that rubric of you get a fruit and you say hey, there's not enough sugar on that, so we're going to add more sugar to it. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, but, but this is important enough to enough people that this got in front of Congress and the USDA and like they lobbied long enough to get it approved that just switching the definition of a cherry product. Oh my gosh. The people versus maraschino cherry. (laughs) (laughs) Also, isn't it nice that we all have our passions? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Yes. So this was in uh, 1939, 1940. And then in 1975, um, The Deputy Associate Commissioner for Compliance of the FDA, he switched it around again, saying that if any artificial flavoring, specifically artificial bitter almond, they always say, if it is used, then it has to be labeled artificial. Mm. (sighs) So it switched again. (laughs) <laughs> this is a, a hyper confusing. Yeah. And then at this point, the same lobbying group, which now that I have it in front of my eyeballs, the Maraschino Cherry and Glacé Fruit Processors. Oh. There's an organization with that name. Incredible. They said, there's no such thing as a natural Maraschino Cherry. Mm. Touche. Yeah. <laughs> That's some honesty, I guess. Yes. <laughs> This, I found this in the New York Times from 1975 in something in a column called Consumer Notes. Mm. And there was this piece and right below it was a little blurb about how starting in April 1975, children's pajamas now had to be flame resistant. (laughs) Oh, oh God. (laughs) I can't. I I (laughs) say that you know safety wise maybe concerns for our health wise we have evolved a lot as a nation in about 30 years you know i was actually surprised that that ruling came as early as 1975 right. it seemed more like of a 90s thing yeah or totally like that totally yeah you're totally right <laughs> and i love that it's not even <laughs> non-flammable yeah it's just flame resistant just that's flame fine <laughs> totally. totally baby steps <laughs> this nation is all about baby steps <laughs> oh my gosh incredible so this is kind of where cherries were stuck Mm. for like three decades that's interesting that you would mention that because uh the 70s drink culture was very heavily grenadine uh drinks like grasshopper which were like bright vivid greens like uh, drinks that as much as i do love 70s culture the drink culture was a bit um hangover inducing yeah so there's this bar called mini bar here in la that for a little while was doing um 70s style oh, drinks. Okay. and um where's mini bar you know where cafe 101 is in that like best western oh, or yeah. whatever it was it's a bar in that same lobby just oh, like if you head in a different realize. direction cool. yeah it's actually a pretty nice place um but this is where i discovered the harvey wallbanger yes yeah it's just it's funny because they were huge drinks mm-hmm. and it's mostly orange juice yep uh, and then the grasshoppers 
is it is it more or less a milkshake? It is. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is what like I creme de menthe. Yes. It. How are you supposed to drink that? I mean, it would be one drink all evening. It would be so filling. If you'd already have dinner, you can't fit probably maybe, but <laughs> I know it, it's interesting because I do think that maybe predominantly it was for those who actually did drink more than just one drink, I think they would lean maybe more towards champagne during that era. Oh. But maybe this was the one cocktail per person style because I, I can't conceive of drinking, especially if you're going out dancing. I mean, you would just be sloshing around on the dance floor. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it is a lot. The 70s were confused. Very confused. I, I, yes. I think they were a fun time for a lot of people, but I also would argue that they're our most disgusting decade. mm in American history. Oh, completely. You know, that's uh, as obviously my entire brand is about advocating for the re-rise of disco. But disco more about fluidity of gender, diversity on the dance floor, like being okay with your most exaggerated self. Not necessarily all the aesthetic points of disco. Uh, I would also say that as somebody who currently lives in a house that was remodeled in the 70s, interior design in the 70s was absolutely horrendous <laughs> well you know all that positive enforcement of not enforcing gender rules mm. um david bowie stuff that kind of thing mm. that's like nice and friendly and fun and, right. and good for people but then you know the straight's got to go and ruin it oh of course that's yes. what happened right yes it is <laughs> to I, the 1970s <laughs> uh, completely i mean the the and ultimate, the death of disco that happened at Wrigley Field with the burning of all the disco records. Yes. Which really did cement that disco had died in the U.S. And then it was pushed to Italy and became more Italo and cosmic disco. So it didn't die. It just went overseas. But it was all about the rise of the straight cis man and making sure that he had his say when it came to American culture and sort of ignoring this incredible hodgepodge of cultures and humanities that was taking place at the disco this is something that always happens whenever like non-cis men start to have a come up in this country completely the dudes freak out because it's the same thing that happened during world war ii yeah the 1930s had actually been getting pretty lit mm -hmm. <laughs> especially for gay culture in that time yes a hardcore before it was even defined as gay exactly so that people could really partake in their their deviances <laughs> yes <laughs> i do like the idea this is i don't know if it lasted all the way into the 30s but like in the 1800s in america homosexuality wasn't um seen as a um definition of your being mm. it was more just like that's that's his hobby Mm, hobby. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of the things you're into. I mean, that's that's ingenious. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it didn't have to define you. Yeah. <laughs> I like fishing. I like Yeah, it does. And a little bit of sodomy. You know? Yeah. Exactly. It's Who great. doesn't? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh gracious. Uh yeah, so skipping ahead from the seventies to the early aughts. Uh there was a bar that opened in New York called Pegu Club. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Mm. I don't know. Apparently, apparently, it's not marketing, that the woman who founded it, Audrey Saunders, um, she was in England and she came across Luxardo cherries for her first time ever. And she was mm. like, this is a maraschino cherry, but like it has flavors and nuance and doesn't just taste like sugar. And it's totally because she bought a bunch of them, opened her extremely hip bar, and brought him back into the forefront of bar culture. Wow. Yeah. Just apparently just this one person um, that Luxardo had to open a whole new cherry orchard. They had to start a whole new one because now all That's of a sudden amazing. this product that had been very niche is less niche now. You can get it in regular grocery stores now. Right. Of course. Yeah. And they're not expensive by any means. No, they're probably more expensive than other jars of cherries. Right. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But they planted like after Pegu Club, this one bar opened. Uh, the orchard has 5,000 cherry trees in it. That's incredible. Yeah. Female cherry trailblazer. Yes. Yes. All about that. That'd be a fun name. Cherry trailblazer. That is a really good name. I'm like drag queen name. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> My favorite drag queen name ever um, was coined by Sam Pancake, who um, also has a podcast on this network called Monday Afternoon Movie. But yeah, he, in one of his shows, uh, he was listing off fun drag names that he came up with. And the one that stuck with me was Blanche Du Bois. 
that's really good isn't it and so obvious yes. you know how that pun is it was right there it was just hanging right there and nobody took it yeah well played yeah well it's played. so good <laughs> oh it's so good <laughs> <laughs> so do you serve drinks with maraschino cherries at your dining club we have. Uh, I would say that uh, we are uh, we are a fan of theatrical garnishes. Uh, that being sort of the most bare bones of the theatrical garnishes, maybe the most uh, the garnish that you first recognize as a garnish when you're younger and drinking for the first time. Sure. Uh, and then also the cliche of trying to make the stem not in your mouth is sort of like a you know if you knew you were a little bit more rambunctious than the average woman, if you could do that, I cannot do that. Well, I've why, tried. Why? why how did that come up who invented that idea i do remember there's a movie that oh hey this is maybe a strange reference but i think the movie is called joyride it's it's a ryan or not ryan it's a uh what's his face from uh fast and the furious who passed away paul walker's in it okay and they have a scene about the importance of a woman being able to not a stem in her mouth and i think it just stuck with me and then it became a parlor trick you know girls who could do it were seemingly better with their tongue. <laughs> yeah. It's well, so that movie's from 2001 and I'm trying to remember I feel like that's the cherry something. I remember that in high school which for me was before 2001. Totally. So that might have been my reference point but like there's there's been many. Okay. I know. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think I, if I remember correctly. It really seems like a trick that like some frat boy like told a girl. 100%. And just to get just to look at her mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Because I don't think anyone can do it, really. That doesn't make I, any I sense. I once met a person, not a girl, though, like a very burly gay man, but he could do of it. Of course. Yeah. I was shook because I thought it was a myth. Yeah. Because you know I don't even conceive of how it could happen. No. Like I put the stem in my mouth and it just comes out straight. Like yeah. I, how, how would you bend it in a way where it's a knot? It completely baffles me. Unless you have that, you know, when you get the cosmetic surgery to cut your tongue into. Yeah, I guess. Okay. <laughs> if you have that. Like so many of us do. <laughs> Although, listeners, if any of you can do it. Yes, like, please. I would love yeah. a, a tutorial. Yes. Send us a video. Yes. It would be interesting. Yeah. And you tell us tell us whether or not we're allowed to post it totally. somewhere publicly. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Speaking of which, what is all your social media? Uh, at Disco Dining Club um, on all social media profiles. So Instagram, Facebook, discodiningclub.com is where you can find out not only about Disco Dining Club, but also upcoming feasts. Um, and most upcoming one being Medusa's Profane Midnight Roos, which is our five-year anniversary event on February 14th and 15th. Are they only in LA? I did uh, an event up in San Francisco, also one in Berlin. And this year we're expanding to other markets. So you'll be finding Disco Dying Club in New York City soon, up in the Bay again. I'm looking to also expand overseas. So Disco Dying Club, every major city. <laughs> That's so fun. Mar Maraschino cherries for all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Courtney, thank you so much. Thank you. again everybody thank you for listening to the show here are this episode's resources i got good information from the book fix the pumps and the book the gentleman's companion was a ton of fun uh, i found a helpful blurb from 1975 in the new york times and more contemporary articles at imbibe epicurious atlas obscura and the new york times again the fda's website had all the technical details and an oregon state university thesis by christopher jolly called Science, Service, and Specialized Agriculture, The Reinvention of the Maraschino Cherry. Uh, that was a wonderful source. These are all in the show notes and on smartmouthpodcast.com. And join us on Instagram at smartmouthpodcast, on Facebook in the private Smartmouth group, and on Twitter at smartmouthpod. 
Smart Mouth is a production of Table Cakes, a woman-owned, Los Angeles-based podcast company. Smart Mouth is hosted and produced by me, Catherine Spires, and engineered by Mika Grimm. Check out all of our shows at tablecakes.com. A Table Cakes production. <laughs>